So um, in this talk, I'm going to cover some of the key findings from three studies that we've conducted over the last two years on the direct and indirect effects of the COVID pandemic. And I'd firstly like to thank our colleagues from the Manchester University NHS Foundation Trust for their uh, excellent clinical input throughout the study. <clears throat> so early on during the first COVID-19 peak in 2020, Colleagues across various teams of the Greater Manchester PSTRC began collaborating on um, an investigation into how COVID had affected the diagnosing in primary care of a range of physical and mental health conditions in the Greater Manchester area. So this work was led by Richard Williams from our informatics team and produced the first paper in the UK on the indirect effects of the pandemic. Uh, at the same time, people with diabetes were receiving a lot of attention in the press and it became clear that they had a greater risk of severe COVID infection and uh, reports began to appear on the number of excess deaths in this patient group. In the first few months of the pandemic, almost a third of all COVID related deaths were in people with diabetes. So although we'd looked at diabetes in the other paper, it was just one of a range of conditions and the data was limited uh, to the Greater Manchester area. So we devised a research program that was effectively split into three separate phases. The first phase we began within a month or so of the start of the first lockdown in um, March 2020, thinking that we'd be looking at a disruption to normal services that would last for up to maybe 12 weeks. Obviously, it's an understatement to say that the actual impact has been much worse. Um, we began to monitor the situation regarding new diagnoses of type 2 diabetes and rates of mortality in patients with a prior diabetes diagnosis. And we started updating our findings on a monthly basis as the pandemic evolved. For the second phase, we decided to investigate the provision of care throughout the whole of 2020 in terms of standard care processes for type two diabetes and also uh, commonly prescribed classes of medication. The third phase is on longer term adverse outcomes in COVID survivors with diabetes and is currently ongoing, but I'll sort of touch on that at the end. So for the first two phases of our research, we use data from the CPRD, uh, the Clinical Practice Research Data Link. Uh, they've been collecting anonymized patient data from a network of GP practices across the UK for more than 30 years now. And patient data is currently available for around 60 million patients, including around 60 million that are currently registered with a contributing practice. The CPRD consists of two databases which draw data from different clinical systems. CPRD Gold uses the vision system and CPRD Aurum uses the EMIS web system. So although there are some gold practices based in England, and there's also a degree of crossover between the two databases because some practices have migrated in recent years from vision to EMIS uh, during our study period, and we, we made the decision to keep our analyses of each database distinct. So we used Orem for our analyses on patients in England and Gold for the other nations of the UK. So these were our objectives for the first phase of the research programme. Uh, we aim to quantify the number of missed or delayed diagnoses of type 2 diabetes across the UK during the pandemic, i.e. from March 2020 onward. We then plan to assess rates of mortality amongst patients with diabetes and determine the level of excess mortality, i.e. beyond that which we would have expected to observe in the absence of the pandemic. We wanted to compare rates of diagnosis and mortality in England with those in the rest of the UK. And since older people and more socially disadvantaged groups have been more affected during the pandemic, we aim to study variation by gender, age group and level of deprivation. When trying to assess the impact of the pandemic on things like health services and death, it's, it's quite common to see comparisons of rates or accounts with the average from the five years prior to the pandemic. And this works fine in situations like the one uh, depicted on the slide where the pre-pandemic rates or accounts were relatively stable over time. So if I overlay a line showing the average from the previous five years, it's clear that the rate or the count in 2020 is much greater than we would have expected to see based upon that average. However, when there is a pre-existing trend, 
a continuation of that trend can look like a large change when compared against the average. So th this is why we need statistical models that incorporate these potential trends if we're to make any reliable comparisons. So this is a very brief overview of the methodology we use to address our research questions. So we extracted historical patient data from both of the CPRD databases covering the 10 years prior to the pandemic. And we used negative binomial regression. So I'm not going to go into that, but it's a type of statistical model designed to model the number of events in a given period of time, whilst also considering the number of people at risk of experiencing that event. So using this approach, we were able to incorporate trends over time um, and assess, you know, was the rate increasing, decreasing or staying the same prior to the pandemic? And we were also to, able to incorporate seasonal patterns, which when you're looking at something like a respiratory illness, you know, things like the flu, they peak in winter. And uh, so you need to sort of take take seasonality into account. We then used our models to compare observed rates during the pandemic against those that we would have expected to see if the pandemic had not occurred. So this figure demonstrates the modeling process for mortality in England between 2010 and 2019. It shows a rate over time, which is the number of events, in this case, uh, deaths in each month uh, for every 100,000 individuals in the population. The purple line is the observed rate and the gold line is our expected rate from our, from our model. Um, the band around the gold line is what we call a 95% confidence interval. Uh, so we're 95% confident that the expected rate falls within that, um, that band. So as you can see, the, the model provides an excellent fit to the data over time and accurately describes the strong seasonal effects with uh, substantially increased rates during the winter months. So this gave us confidence in our modeling approach and the predictions we would then use to compare the observed rates during the pandemic with those we would have expected to see if the pandemic had not happened. So this figure illustrates the comparison of observed and expected rates of new diagnoses in England in 2019 and 2020. The vertical line indicates the start of the pandemic in March 2020. So in April 2020, the rate of new diagnoses was reduced by 70% compared to the expected rate based on the 10-year historical trend. And although the, the observed rate increased gradually between May and December, but levels remained well below the expected rate for the majority of the year. So it's important to note that for any shortfall to have been addressed, the observed rate would have had to go above the expected rate at some point, which it, it didn't at any point during 2020. So we had some discussions with clinicians at the time whose viewpoint was that uh, diagnostic activities were carrying on as normal, but due to increasing demands on their time during the pandemic, GPs were maybe not keeping up with the, the coding of diagnoses and other processes. So we decided to verify if the same drop was observed when we, if we looked at new prescriptions of metformin, which is the most common first line treatment for type two diabetes. And the reason we looked at this is because prescriptions are automatically logged on the system when a script for a medication is issued. So it is probably the most reliable data that we, that we actually have. And the findings seem to confirm our hypothesis that we're there's a substantial reduction in the rate of new diagnoses, particularly in the early stages of the pandemic. So we then looked at the variation in the diagnostic rate for different age groups and by gender and by deprivation quintile where Relative deprivation is measured at the practice level using what's known as the index of multiple deprivation, with quintile one being the least deprived and quintile five being the most deprived. So prior to March 2020, rates of type 2 diabetes diagnoses were higher in older individuals, in men, and in people from more deprived areas. And it's, it's these groups that experienced the greatest reductions in diagnoses during the first COVID peak. Uh, as you can see, the, the trend over time was very similar in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. However, between March and December 
the reduction in new diagnoses was smaller in the rest of the UK at 21% compared with 32% in England. Uh, this is because the observed rate was quicker to catch up to pre-pandemic rates in the rest of the UK. So we estimate that there were around 12,500 missed or delayed diagnoses of type 2 diabetes in English practices contributing to uh, CPRD Aurum between March and December 2020. Similarly, we estimate that there were around 1,300 missed or de delayed diagnoses in practices contributing to CPRD Gold from the rest of the UK. And using data from the Office for National Statistics, we're able to estimate the CPRD's coverage of the respective populations have been roughly 23%. So a very simple calculation suggests that the number of people with a missed or delayed diagnosis across the UK was around 60,000 during 2020. Uh, for mortality, we found that all, although the baseline rate of mortality amongst patients with diabetes was higher in the rest of the UK, the spike in mortality in April 2020 was much greater in England, uh, where the rate of mortality increased by 112% compared with a still substantial 65% increase in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. So the patterns in the rates were almost identical for males and females and for patients in the various levels of deprivation. And as expected, the, the huge spike in the mortality rate was driven by the older age groups as they formed a greater proportion of our patient group with diabetes and were more susceptible to COVID related death as well. So for, for age groups 45 to 64, 65 to 79 and 80 plus, we found the mortality rate to have essentially doubled in April 2020. So our findings from phase one have some important clinical implications. Although clinicians were asked to fulfill their general responsibilities and prioritize acute care in relation to COVID, whilst also ensuring that essential diabetes care continued, in early March 2020, GPs were advised to minimize the number of face-to-face -face contacts they had with their patients. So our findings suggest that this reduction of direct clinical services led to major reductions in the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. So after running a number of monthly updates, we published our findings for this in the uh, Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology. So the second phase of our research program involved the assessment of changes in care for patients with type 2 diabetes before and after the first COVID peak in March 2020. We plan to assess the degree to which the pandemic affected rates of key health checks or so-called care processes and the prescribing behaviour associated with medication commonly used to treat uh, diabetes. Again, conducted investigations to whether or not these processes varied according to age, sex, or the deprivation level of the patient. So in 2008, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence recommended nine essential health checks or care processes that define high quality diabetes care. We focused on the following six health checks, uh, HbA1c, serum creatinine, cholesterol, urinary albumin excretion, blood pressure and BMI assessment. So we restricted our investigation to these six care processes processes because there was a high level of confidence that they had or had not been performed based upon the available primary care records. Uh, for the prescribing component of phase two, we focused on medications commonly issued to patients with type 2 diabetes, obviously anti-diabetic anti drugs, antihypertensives, uh, lipid lowering drugs, mainly uh, statins, and antiplatelets. So we extracted a study cohort of more than 600,000 people with type 2 diabetes and followed them between March and December 2020. So the median age of the patients was about 68 uh, years, 44% of, of our patient group were female and 25% lived in a, the most deprived quintile compared to the rest of the UK. So using HbA1c and blood pressure as examples, you can see significant drops in care process uh, rates after the first lockdown began. And there was a sustained period of between five to 10 months where the rate was significantly lower than we would have expected to see in normal circumstances for all six of the processes we studied. Uh, as, again, as the observed rates did not go above the expected rates at any stage, the, 
obvious conclusion really is that many patients did not receive the necessary level of monitoring during 2020 and that the shortfall was not addressed before the year's end. So in April 2020, the process rates were reduced by between 76% and 88% in England. And similarly in the other UK nations between 74% and 88%. Overall, uh, the rate of perform performing each of the health checks was reduced by 28% and 47% in England, with the most affected health check being blood pressure monitoring. Similar trends observed in the other UK nations, again, blood pressure monitoring being the most affected. So we also group patients according to their gender, age, sort of categorizing as older or younger with uh, 65 as the cutoff and a level of deprivation. So although reductions in care process rates were similar, older people from deprived areas tended to have the greatest reductions in rates, mainly because their uh, pre-pandemic rates were higher. So we, we also assessed changes in the rates of prescribing of new anti-diabetes medication, along with antihypertensives, lipid lowering and antiplatelet medications. And in England, prescribing of new medication fell during April with reductions varying from 10% for antiplatelet agents to 60% uh, for anti-diabetic medications. However, in contrast to the care processes, the largest reductions in rates of prescribing new diabetes medication were initially seen in younger individuals from both deprived and non-deprived backgrounds. Between March and December, the overall rate of prescribing new diabetes medications was reduced by 19% and new antihypertensive medication reduced by 22% in England. Uh, changes in prescribing of new lipid lowering or antiplatelet therapies were not significant. Uh, the only difference in the other UK nations was that the there was a significant reduction in prescribing of new lipid lowering drugs. So, interestingly, the, the reductions in prescribing after the start of the pandemic only really applied to the prescribing of new medications when patients were recently diagnosed or were switching medications. When we included repeat prescriptions and looked at the overall rate, the pandemic did not have an effect on overall prescribing behavior. So it seems that patients did have, didn't have any difficulties obtaining uh, repeat prescriptions, which is reassuring. However, required adjustment, adjustments to dosage or a need to switch medication may not have been picked up without the necessary consultations and tests. So between March and December 2020, there were approximately 7.4 million fewer uh, NICE recommended healthcare checks taking place uh, that took place in UK general practice. Uh, when compared to 10-year historical trends, there was roughly 31,800 fewer people with type 2 diabetes prescribed a new type of diabetes medication, and around 14,500 fewer were prescribed a new type of blood pressure lowering medication. So in, in terms of impact, we published findings from this second phase in the BMJ Quality and Safety, and the publication drew a lot of media attention. Uh, the findings have now been embedded into recovery plans in Greater Manchester for diabetes care processes, with the, the targets being to identify the clinical commissioning groups showing the most significant decline in care process completion and treatment target achievement, and then identify the worst performing primary care networks and practices in order to be able to focus recovery funding on supporting the worst performing practices to improve their overall outcomes. Um, Finally, to develop and perform searches to identify patients from all general practices across Greater Manchester who have not attended for health checks in the last couple of years. So this would enable their GP practices to set up dedicated health check clinics for these patients and where appropriate, intensify their management. And these, these health checks can be uh, done virtually or face-to-face. The aims for the third phase of work were to determine if outcomes such as cardiovascular events, diagnoses of mental illness and death following COVID infection differed for patients with and without diabetes. So we identified a group of patients with diabetes who are, well, we wanted to identify subgroups of patients with diabetes who are at the greatest risk of experiencing adverse events following discharge from hospital with COVID. So 
we use a different data source for this. So TPP, uh, the Phoenix Partnership, is a, a software company which supplies the clinical software system one, which is used in an increasingly large proportion of UK general practices. The database contains anonymized health records for around 24 million patients. And the government's uh, control of patient information known as copy notices were extended during the initial COVID outbreak to allow for a wider use of uh, patient data to respond to the, to the crisis. Uh, Open Safely is a collaboration between TPP, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and Oxford University Data Lab. And so the, the project was designed in response to the pandemic to facilitate analyses using anonymized data without moving it from TPP servers. So research, we can only access the data we need to perform our analyses and no data is ever removed or exported. Uh, so using this approach, projects that would normally take months or years can actually be completed in weeks um, as we've, we've been doing uh, recently. So there was a number of notable advantages to using this data source. As I mentioned, the rapid analysis of data and we're then able to produce outputs which are still relevant to the evolving uh, pandemic at the time of publication. There's also no lag when linking primary care records to hospital records and death uh, data, as there is with other data providers. And most, arguably most importantly, the data can be linked with COVID surveillance databases so that we can identify COVID related hospitalizations and also follow up on patients who had positive uh, PCR tests uh, undertaken in the community. And we were also fortunate to be invited to take part in a pilot scheme to determine the feasibility of making this resource available to external research teams. So as I mentioned, the primary objective for this third phase is to compare longer term outcomes in patients with and without diabetes who survived a COVID related hospitalization. However, to assess the specific effect of COVID, we're also comparing against patients who were hospitalized with a comparable illness in the year prior to the pandemic. So we chose pneumonia as it's also a common serious respiratory illness. In a second set of analyses, we're comparing outcome rates of patients with and without diabetes in the much larger pool of patients who had a positive PCR test at any point during 2020 or 2021. We initially thought this would be a more diverse, diverse group of patients uh, with respect to the severity of their COVID infection, but that might not actually be the case as our hospitalized patients who survived COVID are, um, well, patients at the more severe end of the scale of COVID are less likely to have survived hospitalization and then wouldn't have entered our patient group for, group for the first set of analyses. So it, it's likely that the findings from this second set of analyses will be of interest beyond the immediate diabetes research community because it's a, this broader group that we're looking at. To address our second aim of identifying high risk subgroups, we're comparing rates according to a range of characteristics, including sex, age group, ethnicity, and level of socioeconomic deprivation. So we've been following our various patient groups up on a range of adverse events, some which are fatal, some non-fatal, uh, some for which diabetes and COVID are known or suspected risk factors such as cardiovascular outcomes, stroke, myocardial infarction, uh, renal and liver failure. But we're also looking at some adverse events where where the, the COVID infection is likely to be the key risk factor, but investigating whether the level of risk differed in patients with diabetes. These include various men mental illnesses, depression, anxiety, and psychosis, and related drug prescriptions. Also, we're interested in looking at symptoms of post-COVID syndrome or long COVID, including problems with sleep and fatigue. And finally, uh, looking at death from any, any cause. So we've got approximately 1,400 patients with diabetes who were discharged following a COVID-related hospitalization and nearly 40,000 without diabetes. Our, our diabetes pneumonia group contains nearly 80,000 patients. So the patients in our diabetes group were more likely to be older, male, overweight, live in a deprived area and have histories of cardiovascular and renal disease. After controlling our analyses for these discrepancies between patient groups, we're finding substantially increased risks for a range of cardiovascular outcomes, including ischemic strokes and MI and acute, in, uh, acute kidney injuries when comparing patients with and without diabetes. And we're also finding significantly, significantly increased risks for symptoms of post-COVID syndrome, including insomnia and sleep apnea. Uh, 
However, when we compare our patients with diabetes discharge uh, following a pneumonia-related hospitalization, we find very few differences between the COVID and pneumonia groups. If anything, some rates are actually higher in the pneumonia group, including uh, heart failure and most notably death from any cause. Only really rates of psychosis and fatigue were greater in our uh, COVID group. So for the second set of analyses involving patients with a positive PCR test, we've got a much larger group of patients. The size of the sample means that even small differences can be uh, statistically significant. Um, the rates are greater in the diabetes group for most of our outcomes, and we're currently working on assessing whether the observed differences are actually solely attributable to diabetes and not actually the COVID infection. So final steps of this third phase involve investigations into how the rate comparisons we're interested in differed according to the time since discharge from hospital and also calendar time since the start of the pandemic. And to address the issue of calendar time, we've created intervals that align with clinical advances. So most notably the introduction of steroids to treat infected patients during hospitalization and COVID uh, vaccination schemes. So is my uh, acknowledgements to the various uh, funders and uh, data sources, and I'll uh, hand over now to uh, Chris. Thanks, Matt, that was great. So hopefully everybody can see that. So. Okay, so yeah, my name's uh, Chris Armitage. I'm a professor of health psychology at the University of Manchester. And yes, I want to talk about uh, our behavioural science approaches to the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's sort of a talk in two halves. Um, and I, I think the, the, the sort of take home message is that there are slow ways and quick ways to do to do science and make sure it has an impact on policy. And that's what we've been trying to grapple with. And we think we've found some solutions to it. So I think the starting point for it is probably to address why we need behavioral science approaches to any kind of health problem. So I'm gonna start with a non-COVID example. Um, so our non-COVID example is this one. Um, a few years ago, and this was quite widely trailed in the media, um, there was an idea that uh, you could reduce adolescent pregnancy rates by providing adolescents with uh, infant simulators that looked a bit like this. And they were programmed to cry in the middle of the night, require nurturing, feeding, changing, all these other kinds of things. The idea being that having one of these squealing, squalling brats around the house would immediately put uh, teenagers off having kids. And, you know, sounds fairly common sense, but um, unfortunately, and I say unfortunately with a heavy heart because we've heard a lot of recourse to people's common sense in uh, recent months and years. Unfortunately, what you get is the opposite to the intended effect. And if there's one law of behavioural science, it's the one of unintended consequences. And actually what you get is a fertility effect. You get double the birth rate in, a, in the intervention group. Why do you get that? Well, actually what happens is if you, you, people get attached to these infants, um, you know, like people get attached to their own infants, you know, no dude have children if there wasn't some sort of attachment process. But anyway, what happened was that it built people's confidence in looking after children. It meant that it didn't seem like such a, a traumatic thing to go through. And actually, maybe some people thought, well, is this is this such a bad idea? And so the, the purpose of behavioral science is to try and move away from this sort of appeal to people's common sense and actually to look at the evidence underpinning um, behavior underpinning people's behaviors so uh, i think matt's articulated this so i won't bang on about this but you know in march 2020 a new deadly virus emerges that's got unknown origin uncertain diagnosis unclear transmission there no cures no vaccines nothing the only things that we really did know were that people's behaviors would uh, drive transmission and would help prevent spread of the disease and these behaviours are things such as self-isolation and wearing face coverings. And we also knew that we needed, so we need, knew that we needed to change people's behaviours. And at that time, that was the only game in town. Of course, there are, there are other games in town now, like getting people to take vaccines and 
and, and um, self-isolate and, and other kinds of things, but we'll maybe talk about those later. But the unintended consequences in this case, rather than ending up in an increased pregnancy rate, would be rather costly. And so I took this um, cartoon from the uh, Guardian. And if you look at the sort of top right hand corner, one of the gravestones says used common sense. And, and this has been a familiar refrain, just use your common sense. And of course, my idea of common sense, probably different to everybody else's idea of common sense. And everybody else's common idea of common sense is different again. So, you know, these ideas of, you know, staying alert and, and having various kinds of PPE, you know, you, you, you sort of appeal to people's common sense with, uh, you know, you, you take a huge risk in doing that without having underpinning behavioural science to understand what are the drivers of people's behaviours and, and how to go about changing them. So what, what, what happened? So what, what did we do? Well, of course, um, the, the Im immediate reaction was quick. There's an emergency happening here. Let's apply for some grants to do something. And then in a couple of years, we might get some money to do a systematic review. A few years after that, we can probably develop an intervention. And then 10, 15 years in the future, maybe we'll have developed an intervention that we can actually implement. And of course, you know, in the context of a public health emergency, that's you can't really do that business as usual. Now, that's not to say that we haven't done this kind, that kind of thing. And one of the things I'm talk, going to talk about is the research that we've got ongoing that will help us understand the behaviours involved. So, you know, face coverings, still an issue at the moment, still people not self-isolating. So there are these ongoing issues that we can look into. But the, the idea that you could take a sort of three-stage approach that might take several years to, to fruition was not really on the cards. So these, these are kinds of work that we've been doing. So we, we did do a lot of business as usual kind of stuff. So we've looked at, we, we've used mixed methods. So we've done systematic reviewing, we've done um, focus groups, we've done interviews, we've done surveys, we've done field experiments, all with the intention of trying to understand the behaviors underpinning uh, COVID related behaviors. So things like self-isolation, use of contact tracing apps, anybody remember those? Um, vaccinations, um, general adherence to government instructions. We've done a field experiment in terms of encouraging people to wear face covering and all those kinds of things. And those things, those, that research that we've done is really starting to filter through now. But of course, as you all know, that it, it takes a while to sort of get materials together, to go through ethics, to collect the data, to analyze it, to get it published and through peer review and all those other kinds of things. But what we were facing was a, a public health emergency. So our principal findings to date are that generally the public largely adheres to government related instructions. Um, that's a majority of people, that's not everybody. So clearly more research needed with the, the people that are not. Generally, people feel physically capable of adhering to instructions so you know the, the the instructions are fairly physically easy to to carry out and people are generally highly reflectively motivated and what we mean by this is that people are you can persuade people to do it that people are making conscious decisions they're um you know they're pro they're you know they intend to carry out these particular behaviors so you know th th there's sort of in a way no point in tackling these as behavioral interventions what we also found though is that social opportunity and automatic motivation are much lower so in terms of social opportunity people are looking at other people around them who are not following rules or adhering to guidelines people are not seeing role models um, acting in the, quite the way that they should, and that's undermining their um, abilities to carry out the appropriate behaviours, and low in automatic motivation as well. And what this means is that people are struggling to form new habits, to uh, deal with emotions that uh, undermine people's behaviour change. So these are the two areas that we're going to focus on in terms of developing future interventions to deal with uh, you know, future issues of this kind. What we've also identified are the kinds of people that we need to be targeting. And, you know, what we found is that it tends to be uh, men who tend to be less adherent, younger people, 
and people from minority ethnic backgrounds. So these are areas where we need to target. And again, this, this would be an appeal for further research. So this would be, these are the groups we need to look at to develop interventions. But of course, starting that um, in March 2020, that's, that's you know, it, it's, it's going to take a long time to develop that evidence base. So that's, that's the kind of thing that we're doing. And it's kind of described that as the sort of slow, slow approach. So what we're doing at the minute are doing things like identifying intervention options, identifying the content of in interventions and the implementation options, and exploring further sort of specific contexts. But of course, that, that works on, that's works ongoing. And um, I'm not sure how true this is, but there's a feeling that the worst of the pandemic is behind us. It's work still worthwhile doing because uh, what we're doing is contributing to theories that underpin other kinds of behaviours. You know, this is translatable to other kinds of behaviours. But what I mostly want to talk about are these sort of ways in which we were able to respond very quickly to um, re requests for information. So I've just mentioned theory there. So the, our, our research programme is really geared around addressing theoretical questions about how you change people's behavior. And underpinning it is the idea that people's behavior is driven by uh, particular kinds of constructs. And that whether you're talking about hand hygiene or self-isolation, um, you know, there are some underpinning principles that we can get at. So that kind of work that we've been doing that's relatively slow is, is going to contribute and will contribute to other behaviors such as you know, adherence to medication or quitting smoking or all those other kinds of things, because you can translate across those uh, findings. But what we were struck by are lots of requests for information and help from people in public health, from uh, local councils, from Public Health England, asking us things like, what are the key strategies for hand hygiene? How can we enhance self-isolation? Can you give us guidance on public health messaging? And of course, if you reply going, well, give us a couple of years, we'll come back to you, um, that really wasn't actually going to help. So what we were able to do was to use our behavioral science theory and the evidence that we'd already got in other areas to try and address this public health emergency. So we'd never seen a lockdown before. Um, we, we didn't know what it in, involved, what it entailed, but we knew what processes underpin human behavior. And so if you know something about those processes, then you can begin to develop new interventions to try and change what is essentially were new behaviors. And this is our sort of top-down intervention development. And what this gives us is the opportunity to develop, deliver effective solutions rapidly. So what we're doing is drawing on a body of behavior change theory and evidence to deliver effective solutions and a, a colleague described it as I'd rather have a health psychology make a guess than somebody with no training no knowledge of theory methods and evaluation and what's interesting about the sort of debates about mask wearing or not um, is is that um, quite often it's uh, people with little of that training in theory methods and evaluation who are very ready to make comments about this kind of thing Whereas there is a whole profession out there of people who do know the evidence base. And that's what we really wanted to bring to play in terms of the response to the pandemic. So I want to talk about our Behavioural Science and Disease Prevention Task Force. And this was brought together by the British uh, Psychological Society uh, that involved a variety of stakeholders, some of whom were psychologists, but many of whom were people working in practice, people working in policy, people who represented the four home nations who met weekly, fortnightly, and now monthly. And we've written a paper about this. It's about trying to get uh, how you gain consensus rapidly among experts. So at the start, we agreed a sort of core theoretical framework. And I do think this theoretical framework is really important because where there are gaps in evidence, if you have a good theory, then that can help you plug some of those gaps and propose solutions. Uh, we had a collective approach to production and dissemination. So that meant we had co-authorship on all outputs and shared dissemination slides. So thanks to colleagues who've provided slides and apologies for those who may have seen some of these slides again, as well as open science principles. 
we were committed to having an evidence base that was facilitated by rapid reviews or other data that we could collect. But of course, you know, we were dealing with things very, very, very quickly. And so, you know, some of the rapid reviews were incredibly rapid, others were more sort of systematic. So I'm not going to go in, into depth about theory, but we sort of signed up to a theoretical framework known as the behavior change wheel that provides a guide for developing um, theory based interventions. And what it does is it gives you ideas of the kinds of policy categories you might involve, the kinds of intervention functions you might want to tap, the types of uh, constructs that you might want to influence and the kind of behaviors that you the kind of behavior change techniques you might want to deploy and we use this framework because it's based on uh, 83 different models or theories of human behavior and behavior change so it taps into a lot of the um, kind of existing literature and the sort of three second elevator pitch is the the things that you need to do to change people that people's behavior is to ensure that they're capable, are motivated, and have the opportunity to perform that behaviour. And in one sense, that's it. On the other hand, there are over 120 odd constructs, 93 behaviour change techniques. So there are a variety of different de depths to it. And people, just, it's, it's called the behaviour change wheel, but I think it's more like the behaviour change cylinder because there are sort of vastly hidden depths to it. So we had a principles of open science. Uh, so all the things that we were producing uh, were uploaded to um, uh, op the open science framework. So people could see them rapidly, read them, cite them, um, critique them. We also had the principle of ensuring that we were aiming for academic publication as well, because of course, if you want to provide advice, then um, it's really, really important that ultimately it appears in peer-reviewed journals, although that's obviously quite a bit slower than, than what was needed at the time. We also co-created a series of guidance documents that um, were produced by the British Psychological Society, and um, we, we sort of disseminated these widely. We had good links into uh, SAGE and uh, Public Health England, um, as was, and other different stakeholder groups. And we did things like uh, provide behavioral diagnosis. So, um, you know, it's one thing to observe that, um, you know, people are, I don't know, people are drinking more or, or drinking less during the pandemic, but knowing why they're doing that's really important. And so our behavioral diagnoses are able to identify the why of what it is that people do. And once you know why people are doing things, you can begin to develop interventions to change them. We're able to provide practical applications. So, in this uh, guidance, this was about um, encouraging hand hygiene in the community. This was one of the projects in which we tied up with the World Health Organization. Because interestingly enough, the World Health Organization has for years been promoting hand hygiene. They just hadn't done it in Western Europe before. And so, we're able to develop guidance co produced by the World Health Organization to encourage high hand hygiene in the community, which obviously became important during the pandemic. We were able to deal with specific issues as well. So this one was on contact tracing apps. Um, and this particular guidance we were able to base on a rapid review of the evidence, as well as, as, well as people's expertise. But this involved sort of crowdsourcing of um, willing volunteers to help uh, review the literature code studies and do all those things that normally take months to do. But these were the sort of key messages that came out of it. So this was actually the first thing that we presented. So I'll just give you a little bit more of the detail of the kinds of things that we're recommending. And again, this is all based on, on, on the evidence. So, you know, recommendations like minimizing the I and emphasizing the we. So in communications, it's about we rather than I. And you would be surprised at how little that was actually done, but it's been shown to be an effective means of persuading people. Delivering messages from a credible source in relatable terms to the target audience. Again, it's surprising how few times messages came from credible sources or the fact that credible source is a, a movable feast. So what was credible one day is not necessarily credible the next day. Also thinking about the target audience. So what are the relatable terms to the, to the people that you're talking to? Creating worry, but not fear. 
So quite a lot of the time people, I think, were trying to induce fear in people. But we know from, again, research and evidence, not in relation to COVID, but in relation to other conditions, that fear undermines people's responsiveness. If people are fearful, they tend to uh, engage in maladaptive coping. So, you know, cigarette smoking or, or those kinds of things. But if people are worried, it's just that point at which they're in engaged in the problem sufficiently to change their behaviour. Want to identify what influences each preventive behaviour and ensure policies, messaging and interventions target all relevant drivers. And of course, it looks simple to, written down like that, but actually that's, that's an incredible amount of work to do to identify what, identif what influences each preventive behaviour. And that, that's ongoing. I mean, that's that slow work I was talking about. We're still trying to identify what are all those relevant drivers. Uh, clearly specifying behaviours and their effectiveness. So if you remember right at the very beginning, we have this clear message of stay home and protect the NHS. You see, incredibly clear. Then they abruptly changed it to stay alert and uh, control the virus. I don't know what stay alert means. I don't know how to control the virus. So it um, undermines the messaging it immediately as soon as they've done that. Um, interestingly enough, they had a, a change from a, a red background to a green background for those messages as well. So it's really important to clearly specify behaviours because it's, it, it's people think in terms of behaviours rather than outcomes. Um, avoid unintended ne negative consequences. Of course, this is not always possible but clear thought needs to be going into whatever the intervention is going to be. Create clear channels of access for health literacy. So again, this is knowing your audience and knowing through which channels you need to communicate with them. So it's not sufficient just to tweet people. Um, and, and, and again, a lot, of, a lot of the communication has relied on the web for, for um, reaching out to people. Use uh, behavioural scientists and psychological evidence-based support the COVID response. Uh, I mean, I guess we would say that, wouldn't we? Uh, and then make a pledge to work together through multidisciplinary approach. And one of the things we we're very keen to do was to adopt this multidisciplinary approach. And I think we were generally successful in doing that. So these are the kinds of guidance that we were sending. And, you know, we've managed to have some level of impact with this kind of thing. And we really... I, I think we're surprised, but it was especially very pleased to see that we saw our guidance translated into Japanese. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to make a claim for global impact on that basis. Um, we also get frequent mentions in SAGE papers. Um, we have uh, close links with the SPY B subcommittee, um, and you know they were very keen on our rapid reviews. I guess, I suppose as well, that we were really pleased with our regional impacts, um, particularly in dealing with our sort of local directors of public health. So we got feedback from um, uh, you know, places sort of far and wide who were particularly kind of keen and on, on the work that we've been doing. So, you know, North Yorkshire County Council found the guidance invaluable and welcomed the way that it was accessible, easy to follow and not too academic. Uh, saying that their whole public health strategy had been based on the kind of work that we've been doing. So we've had some really good feedback from, um, you know, sort of globally, nationally, and, you know, at the local level as well, because some of that tailoring of messages is, is really best done on that sort of local level. So our ongoing work is for the papers submitted in preparation. And these are the raw ingredients with which we can develop interventions in the future. And it's not just developing interventions related to COVID-19, it's, it's contributing to theory and evidence that can be used to help in other areas of health behavior as well. Medication adherence, physical activity uptake, rehabilitation, all of those kinds of things, because we have this common theoretical base with which we're working. We've also published a methodology paper on the process of our rapid iterative consensus, which I hope will be helpful in the future going forward should anything like this emerge again. And we're currently working on a UKRI national core study grant on SARS-CoV-2 transmission in occupational and public transport settings. And in, in future sort of horizon scanning, better preparedness for future public health emergencies, but really keeping that basic science that underpins behaviour change and you know, complete the quote that I presented before, 
Although we've never seen a lockdown before, so we cannot predict what the outcomes will be directly, we do know what the processes are. So knowing about those processes really gives you a handle on what the interventions and challenges of the future might be. So yeah, just to acknowledge funding from Manchester Centre for Health Psychology, the PTSRC and PSTRC, sorry, and the BRC, but also to sort of colleagues who contributed voluntarily to this, these um, efforts, including colleagues at the University of Manchester, including Joe Hart, Lucy Byrne Davies and Tracy Epton. And with that, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you, Matt, uh, for two excellent presentations. And um, I'd like to open up the seminar for questions now. So please do feel free to switch on your cameras. Uh, it'd be nice to see a few faces at the seminar. Um, we've had a few questions that have come through from the chat. So if anyone does have questions, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, and I'll try to work through as many as possible um, in the time available. Um, Chris, I'll start, I'll start with you if possible. Um, you mentioned work you've done about uptake of vaccinations. Um, and we've had one kind of question that's come through on the chat, um, which asks, let me find this now, it'll be a second. How can we use behavioural science to improve vaccine uptake? So we'd be interested to hear your thoughts. Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, do you want the, the, the quick approach or the slow approach? So the slow approach would be to identify um, the barriers and facilitators to vaccine uptake in whichever particular target groups and then use frameworks like the behavior change wheel to develop behavior change techniques to overcome them um, that would take quite a long time to do um, the other approach would be to take interventions that have worked elsewhere in terms of not just covid vaccines but other kinds of vaccines take the best of what's worked elsewhere and then try it in relation to COVID. Um, okay, so thank are, you. Those are two approaches, one quicker than the other. Okay, thank you. Um, we've had several questions coming through, Matt, relating to your presentation on, on diabetes. Um, one question in particular is, do we know the effects of COVID on people with diabetes when whether this differs by the type of diabetes? Um, well, uh, we know that um, both you know, both are associated, both types of diabetes are associated with increased uh, risk of, of hospital uh, death. Um, and we know that there's similar uh, drivers between the two types of diabetes in terms of uh, being male, uh, older, having renal impairment, um, and non-white ethnicity, uh, being deprived, and also having previous uh, stroke and heart failure. Uh, those, those are all sort of factors that are common across both types of diabetes, which were associated with uh, poor outcomes for COVID. Okay. And another question um, relates to whether or not we know whether COVID-19 affects hypoglycemia. Yeah, so uh, I, I discussed this with um, Professor Martin Rutter, who's a clinical lead on uh, this work, and he, we've not seen any uh, evidence that there's a direct effect of COVID on uh, hypoglycemia. But uh, Martin suggested that if they were, uh, if they're infected and not eating properly, then if they didn't reduce their doses of uh, medications such as uh, sulfonylureas or insulin, um, then they could be prone to hypoglycemia because uh, these are drugs that can potentially cause hypoglycemia. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, one more question that's come through is. What's the significance of the recent CDC paper on COVID infection being associated with worsening a new diabetes diagnosis um, among patients less than 18? Um, so yeah, I mean, this, this provides further evidence that uh, COVID infection can, can damage the pancreas and potentially cause diabetes. Um, I think half, half the children presented with um, diabetes ketoacidosis, which uh, is a, could be a direct effect of the virus on the pancreas. Um, this, the study supports uh, COVID vaccination in children and adolescents. However, uh, one, one caveat is that the study was not able to distinguish between uh, type of diabetes. Again, that's, that's all information from Martin, not <laughs> from myself. Okay. And then one final question that's come through, um, and again, Martin may be able to help answer this one possibly, is <laughs> well, what's the effect of metabolic syndrome for COVID outcome, for example, hospitalisation due to COVID and COVID death? 
Um, thanks, Darren. Yeah, it's um, it's a good question, and the features of the metabolic syndrome, things like obesity, hypertension, and dyslipidemia, they all appear to be uh, independently affecting risk of adverse outcomes. So, particularly obesity and hypertension, they seem to be you know, two of the strongest risk factors. So that partly explains, I think, you know, the, the link between type 2 diabetes and adverse outcomes. Um, and of course, lockdown has had quite an adverse effect on um, metabolic syndrome risk factors. So we know that obesity has, uh, has increased, you know, during lockdown for many people. Um, physical activity, diets changed, stress, alcohol intake and so on have contributed to all of this. And of course, mental health. So um, me metabolic syndrome has become, you know, more of an issue during lockdown than it would have been otherwise. And as I said, all of these risk factors potentially increase the risk of adverse outcomes. Um, so I hope that helps to explain. Thank you, Martin. Um, any more questions from the audience in relation to either presentation? Okay. I can't see any hands raised and um, can't see any further questions coming into the chat. Oh, there we go. Um, Sarah? Uh, yeah, I put one in the chat, actually. Um, oh, sorry. I missed that. Yeah, it, it, well, it, based on the, the graphs that you showed about the misdiagnosis and um, that, that sort of big, big drop off, do you know what, can you estimate how many people with pre-diabetes or who were in the borderline um, prior to the pandemic starting, how, how many of those might have missed the, the sort of supervision and checks and what the impact of either that misdiagnosis could be or the impact of not knowing what those numbers are? Yeah, I mean, if, if uh, prior to the pandemic, we already knew, you know, via sort of HbA1c or maybe coding off pre-diabetes that they were in that group, then yes, we'd be able to determine whether they receive, you know, they receive the uh, necessary checks after the start of the pandemic. If we, if they weren't already on the radar, so to speak, I don't know how we'd be able to pick them up if they didn't have their uh, various uh, processes, uh, you know, such as HbA1c measured. So uh, there will always be that group that could have been um, prevented uh, from moving into uh, into uh, the diabetes group, but we'll never know what that number was, unfortunately, because we've just no way of identifying them. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps if I could just jump in and just add to what Matt said, I agree. And, you know, these people aren't very readily identified, but I think the people uh, that we've, we would have expected to have developed diabetes would almost certainly have had pre-diabetes. So they would have had that HbA1 that wasn't quite crossing the threshold for diabetes, but they would have been in that risk group. It's the people that we've not seen diagnosed with diabetes during the pandemic that are that group. Uh, so we've estimated that you know, 60,000 people in the UK between March and December 2020 weren't diagnosed that really ought to have been diagnosed. So that's they all probably, uh, or the majority of those would have had pre-diabetes. And if we extend that, if we extrapolate into last year, 2021, you know, it may be 100,000 people. It's difficult to know because we don't have the data, but um, it's a huge number of people who would have been diagnosed with diabetes um, that weren't, they were missed, and these are delayed diabetes. And of course, all that illness, if you look at it that way, is still out there in the community probably. And all that hyperglycemia is having adverse effects on, on people's health. So there's quite a lot of catch-up work to do in primary care to identify these people and to manage them appropriately. Okay. So it's, um, it's just gone four o'clock now. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending this seminar and in particular, thank our two speakers, um, Chris and Matt for two excellent presentations. Um, I'd just like to highlight that um, the next seminar um, will be held on the 23rd of February and that'll be delivered by Professor Niels Peake. Niels Peake is the um, lead for our safety informatics team in the Patient Safety Centre, but he's also the director of the Christabel Pankhurst Institute. So um, please do tune in for the next um, seminar and um, thank you very much for your attention.